This video offers the methods, tools, and products I use to make these wet molded leather coin purses with a sorting tray and earth magnet latch. The 3 inch high, 3 and 3 quarter inch wide, and 3 quarter inch deep horseshoe shape fits comfortably in the palm of one's hand and the line back pocket offers a snug fit for a spare SD card, USB drive, or a few spare keys. The tray is a quarter inch deep to hold lots of coins as they are being sorted, and the earth magnets help to hold onto the coins too. I grew up in the 1970s, so coin currency was a normal way to pay for things, and coin purses were quite common. Today, most transactions are completed electronically, but like many of you, I need coins for parking meters and any vending machine products I fancy on my travels. So having a little coin purse stowed in my Jeep Center console comes in handy. I wanted to make a few coin purses that were heavy duty for the small size and of a high quality vegetable tan leather. I used a wet mold I made for molding 2 ounce calf leather, which is very soft and used 3 to 4 ounce vegetable tan strap leather which is a lot stiffer instead and had really good results. This four part wet mold was laser cut from 1 quarter inch MDF for both the exterior and liner of the coin purse with the space between the negative and positive being a sixteenth of an inch. The mold for the inside pocket makes two pockets so one pocket will be extra and the mold for the tray and opposite side of the inside pocket makes one so four molds are needed. The tray folds on to the top of the pocket so the top of the tray is offset a sixteenth of an inch and I added reference pins at the fold to make it easier to line the pocket and sorting tray up symmetrically while the wet leather is stretched to fill the mold. The leather I bought from Wicked and Craig, it's their standard grade vegetable tan strap leather and molds easily. I soaked the leather for 10 minutes in room temperature water and squeezed the leather in the mold using plastic wrap as a moisture barrier from the MDF I used and to help release the leather after it is squeezed into the mold. I use a small workbench vise and clamp squeezing tight for about 20 minutes, then release them, but leave them on the mold bottom as they dry overnight. I bought a Glowforge laser printer close to when the company started, and I'm very happy with it. It prints 1 8th acrylic very accurately. However, when I bought the machine, I was a little disappointed that I could not buy my materials directly from Glowforge because they don't deliver to Canada. So if anyone is interested in an alternative source of materials, I buy my high quality laser grade materials from Trotec. The 1 8 inch acrylic pattern shape is sturdy enough to clamp to a cutting mat on top of the leather and trace around with a hobby knife to make the part. The acrylic I use is strong enough to use as tool alignment and glue up jigs, which is very helpful to keep molded leather lined up and square as the glue dries. Since the inside pocket molds were made to make two, the MDF molds I made were great to stretch the leather tight so it was easier to cut the parts in half with a straight line, and a center finding ruler makes it easier to measure. This is a January 2024 project for me so it is a little too cold to spray outside. When I spray inside, I use a spray tent with a makeshift cardboard spray box in the middle of the tent and a thin metal grate as a spray surface. Then add a sheet or two of white paper to avoid color transfer between colors. For the best results, I only spray bone dry leather. If I were to spray a color shortly after the leather parts are molded, the dye will not be absorbed into the leather uniformly. I use a small air compressor and a basic hobby bottom fed airbrush with large capacity bottles. Then open the nozzle full and with short bursts of dye relatively far from the surface, spray a mist of dye to flood evenly, rotating the parts as needed for even coverage. You do not want to spray too long in one spot or you will add too much dye and affect the appearance, maybe negatively. I use a Phoebeans product called Echo Flow and am spraying scarlet red and coal black. I use a water bottle to flush the gun between colors and spray until the right color is ready to spray. I wear a mask and rubber gloves as a safety precaution. Then I let the leather dry completely, which is usually a few hours. After the rough parts are sprayed and allowed to dry, the work begins on the details. Leather expands and contracts with the amount of moisture, so I make the acrylic templates to fit when the parts are dry. 
Spring clamps are very useful to me in my shop and are great for controlling the amount of pressure I add. Too much pressure and the acrylic can mark the surface of the leather and not enough pressure the template will move. Since I use a set of 8 inch standoffs to elevate my materials to film them better, it is easy for me to clamp to the edge of my 12 inch marble slab which creates a hard and flat surface for my cutting mat. Like many of you watching, the tools we use are important to us. I buy the highest quality I can afford. As my interest in this artisan craft grows, so does my tool collection, shop jigs and materials to play with. My recent purchase from Crimson Hide included a flat blade skyvy knife and a set of wing dividers that I enjoy using. Sponge applicators are my favorite shop supply and little plastic disposable cups are reusable and come in handy for a small project like this one with lots of little touch-up details. A punch pad is a square piece of scrap used to protect the bottom line surface of the leather and since the edges are skived down, a leather worker's hammer will help embed the stitches in the curve to protect the thread from getting caught on something during use. To get a nice smooth edge after beveling, sanding and dyeing, a burnishing agent like gum tragicanth is applied and makes the surface a bit sticky. So when a burnishing tool is rubbed against the edge, all the leather fibers become compacted and smooth. This needs to be done to get a nice smooth finish for when the edge paint is applied. Sometimes several layers of edge paint is required for the smoothest finish, so a light sanding between layers helps to remove high spots. The edge paint roller I bought from Tandy Leather Supply is the one I use most often, and a few small pieces of plastic will elevate the flat piece of leather so the edge paint can dry without sticking to anything. The glue I use is Echo Flow Leathercraft glue, and I chose it because it is water based and low VOC. Wet molded leather parts can be difficult to sew on a machine, so a saddle stitch is the best choice. I use John James number 004 Saddler's Harness Needles and reads a yellow 0.6 millimeter bonded nylon thread. After I thread my needles, I start a row of stitching with a back stitch, or in this case a triple back stitch, so I start on the fourth hole. I like to stitch moving forward, pulling the material towards me, then finish with a triple back stitch. To finish a row of stitching, I use a square nut to tie off the ends in the back. Then use a lighter or battery powered thread zapper to burn off the ends. When stitching small molded leather parts like this purse, it is essential to be able to control the material without damaging it. So the acrylic templates were great to help strengthen the clamps hold on the leather part and small electrical clips hold the template to the part as it is being stitched. I have a few stitching clamps which are also called stitching ponies but the original stitching horse from Tandy Leather Supply is the clamp used here. Since this is an oddly shaped piece having a clamp that can move freely and be adjustable in an efficient way is important to me because bending my fingers and wrists reaching to get to the next hole is harder on my joints and tendons. I like to use a French style stitching awl. This one is Verhey Blanchard and I like to sharpen the tip with a rounded spear shape instead of a sharp point. Blanchard is a company that has been around since the 1800s and makes very high quality tools. When I punch the stitch mark holes through, I twist my wrist gently back and forth to open the hole a bit to make it easier to pass the needles through. Earth magnets are thin, so they are easy to mold by pressing a half inch magnet into a three quarter inch hole. Then when the earth magnet is glued and stitched in place, it is trapped. When working with molded leather parts, especially when they are small like this coin purse, the surfaces we use to work on need to be modified to accommodate the new shape. So a piece of wood with the same dimensions makes a new work surface. 
Small punch pads are a good idea to protect the tools against hard work surfaces. Since I used the same pattern for two coin purses, I made one with a rounded corner at the bend instead of square, and the center adjustment tab in the center of the lining was stitched on top for one and underneath for the other after the lining was sized to fit, then assembled them in the same way. Glue and stitch one side at a time leaving a one inch strip without glue so the bend on the back and lining can move freely. Heavy duty electrical clamps work great to distribute equal pressure around the seam. After all the stitching is completed and the coin purses are tested and function well, the edges need to be finished. I used my electric sander and finished with sanding sticks to speed up the process a bit, then beveled and dyed the edges. When dry, the edges are burnished and painted, then gently sanded between layers until a nice finish is achieved. The final conditioning is when the hard and stiff building materials I used are turned into a luxurious soft to the touch leather coin purse. I like to use a Phoebe's oil and wax product called Aussie and use paper towels to rub it in, then remove the excess. A bone folder is an excellent tool to help open the back pocket a little bit, making it easier to condition the inside of the pocket. I will continue again in a few days after the conditioner has had a chance to be absorbed, then add more conditioner when needed. The conditioner will help stop the strap leather from cracking and provide a nice soft finish that allows the leather coin purse to age gracefully as it is used, developing into a worn-in patina that improves with age.